starting. Did you start recording also? Not yet. Так, should I start or it will be some introduction first? Okay. Yeah. Someone would introduce. It's okay. I mean, uh, you can go ahead. I'm just starting the uh, recording. Okay. Thank you very much for possibility to give one more talk. Sir, your... uh, yeah, Devendra, uh -huh. Devendra, you can you can introduce the speaker. Uh -huh. Hello all. So today we have a speaker, Professor Alexander Mednik, who talked last week on his first talk, and today he will be talking to. Okay, thank you very much for introduction. Today I continue uh, the subject graph as Riemann surfaces, and uh, the main consideration of my lecture today will be uniformization theory for graphs, branch covering of graphs, cyclic action, and also hyperelliptic graphs as well. As before, mostly I will be concentrated on the results obtained by my collaborators from the Siberian team. And uh, I prefer to speak also about new results which I obtained just recently. Okay. Let me try. Uh, okay. Uh, oy, oy, just, just one moment, please. Something. Oh, sorry, something interrupt me. Okay, okay. Yes. Yes. Oh. Uh -huh. So let me start. Let me continue. Uh, so mostly I will talk about uh, cyclic action on the graph. And uh, in this case, it's very natural to mention very old result which belongs to the woman who was living in the same time as the Gurwitz. And the classical result obtained by him told us that the upper bound for the automorphism of Riemann surfaces of genus G in greater or equal to uh, can be estimated from the uh, upper side by bound G, 4G plus 2. Uh, this bound is attained for any uh, G and the optomorphism of the maximum po possible order every time has only one fixed point. Uh, much more later, Schemberg investigated the situation when cyclic aftermorphism of the Riemann uh, surface has two fixed points. In this case, the order of such aftermorphism does not exceed four times G. And also in their well-known book, Farkas and Kra, investigated the case of the conformal aftermorphism with K fixed point where K is greater than two. Uh, in this case, the order of the respective cyclic group is bounded uh, by the following uh, constant. Uh, later, uh, a few people, uh, together with Grzegorz Gramatsky, proved that this bound is attained for arbitrary G and K on the condition that uh, this quotient is an integer. In the discrete case, the women upper bound was mentioned in my previous lecture. And in the case of 
graph, when we can see the group on a graph, then the order two g plus one, and this number is achieved for any even g. Contrary to the theory of Riemann surfaces, uh, the maximum order in the graph case is attained for the automorphism acting without fixed point. So there is a small difference. The bound in some sense is two times less, but uh, we have no fixed point in the case when we consider the maximum possible order of automorphism group. This is just beginning of story. I will talk more concrete about all these results and also I tend to show some examples to illustrate these possible estimates. Okay, uh, now just a very preliminary result, very preliminary result. Uh, we have just uh, uh, to understand what kind of notions we will use, what kind of definition are very natural in the case of graph theory. And uh, in our case, we can see the uh, finite group G acting, uh, acting on the graph G. This action is supposed to be harmonically, so there are no fixed ages under these actions. And for every vertex, for every vertex, uh, for every for every vertex, tag, sorry, something, something very wrong. I don't understand what happens. Just sorry, some some problem, some technical problem. Так, could you see the slide again? You are unable to see at present, but maybe. Can you, you can you retry again uh, sharing? Uh -huh. yes, please. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Now I should find the main. Uh, oh, share screen. Uh -huh. Now it's better. Now I. <laughs> Uh, again, the same problem. I cannot see my file. Uh, it was before we share some administration. Maybe we should to do this again. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, 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 no. Mm. Uh, так, still nothing, still nothing. Так. So I cannot share the screen indeed. Well, you have to click on share screen. Yes, of course I yes. can. And then but after that, you can put it. Before we share some administration and it was done perfectly. Hmm. Now nothing. Uh, you must be having it on your screen somewhere. It has gone down probably on your screen. Yeah, we can see your screen. Oh, again, it's gone. No, you can see what my screen or lecture what I cannot see your myself. your desktop. Your desktop was seen for a uh, one or two seconds. No, I cannot see my desktop. Just yours. Just yours, not mine. Так, no. No, again nothing. Otherwise you can send a presentation by email and then yes. somebody else can try to. Yeah. Devendra, can you share uh, if it is available? Uh, Yes, let's try it once more. No. Yeah, we can see the desktop, I think the desktop. Which we see, we see 11. Well, well, well. Should try. Should 
Так, now it's better. Could you see a text? No. Так, could you see the lecture or not? We see now. No, this is okay. Uh, yes, I don't know what is the reason. Aha. So now we, again. Can you can you zoom out a little bit? It's it's too big. It is going out. <clears throat> so too big. What do you mean too big? Uh, please zoom in. Ah, you mean sound or what? Zoom. Uh, it is going out of the screen right now. But so, could you see the screen or not? Some of the some of the uh, letters are outside the sharing, so it, it's. So you said that it's too big, or what? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. What happens now? It's like right. small. A bit more. Small. Yeah. It is still going slightly. Ah, no. no. Smaller. smaller. No. Uh, yes. Bigger. No. Yeah. Ah. Wait. Wait. Yes. It is okay. Almost. But now. Ah. You Still big or not? Or, or is it possible? It's bigger now, not uh, than required. Uh, if you make it slightly smaller, then probably it will come inside. <laughs> inside so the still I need to make it more smaller? Yes. More smaller. Так, ну, а чем будет смог молодо? Уже, наверное, правка. Так, вот you can see now, still big? It is yes, bigger, sir. it is outside, huh? going outside. Going outside, yes. Mm -hmm. Так, вот now, вот. Так, вот is now. Could you see там? Still be the same thing. We are missing the part from all sides. What is outside? Так. Yeah, no. Yes, yes. Yes. Now, yes, it is correct. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Still yes. have no idea how it's managed. <laughs> well, let's try to continue, friends. So again, we have a finite group acting harmonically on a graph G. For every vertex of this graph, we denote by G sub V the stabilizer of the point. 
And the model of this guy is just order of the stabilized. Uh, also, to each vertex of the factor graph, of the factor graph, we prescribe a number which is exactly the size of the stabilizer. So now V is the vertex in the factor graph. V with the wave is just a lifting of this vertex. So we are looking for stabilizer of the lifting vertex here. Uh, because the action is regular, any lifting of vertex V is enough to calculate this number. This is just branch index, branch order, nothing serious. Uh, so for each point of E in such a manner, we are able to prescribe a number M sub V, which is greater or equal to, which could be a branch point of order V. In this case, of course, we suppose that stabilizer is non-trivial group uh, in our situation. As before, we defined a genus of graph as the east cyclomatic number or the same as Betty number. Equivalently, the people who like gomology theory could say this is just rank of the first gomology group. More precisely, the genus is one minus the number of vertices plus the number of edges of our graph. Okay. Now we prefer to view the quotient graph X over G as one dimensional or before. In this case, the notion of the signature is very important. If group G acts harmonically on the graph X as before, then the signature of factor graph is defined as a sequences, where the first number in this sequences is just genus of factor graph and the all other numbers is just branch orders of the column. Exactly the same situation is very common in Riemann surface theory when we deal with the action of finite group. I hope this is understandable for people who deal with Riemann surfaces very often. Okay, now, now again, let me consider a finite connected graph Loop and multiple edges in principle are possible. There are no problem in this theory. We provide each edge of graph, including loops, by two possible orientation. Again, we define the genus of graph as the rank of the first gomology group. Uh, as before, we suppose that automorphism group is acting harmonically. So this means it works freely on the set of directed action. It also has no invertible edges. Uh, a finite group acting harmonically on a graph of genus G is a discrete analog of the finite group of automorphism of the closed Riemann surface of genus G. It was mentioned in my previous lecture then by Scott Corey and also by the uh, paper published by Professor Kulkarni, uh, the classical version of the Gurwitz bound can be fine. This bound is six times G minus one. Uh, before in classical theory of Riemann surfaces it was just 84 to G minus one. I just remember that in previous version, in previous lecture, the version discrete version of Aikawa and Arakawa theorem and also a refined version of Burvis theorem for various classes of group was established. This is a number of papers together with my collaborators. Uh, now we consider just one automorphism, one particular automorphism of the graph X. This automorphism is said to be harmonic is the group, the cyclic group generated of uh, this automorphism acts harmonically on a graph. Uh, it was already mentioned that there is a discrete version of the Riemann theorem uh, mentioned above. More precisely, uh, it was shown in our paper in 2015 that if we consider harmonic automorphism of the graph on the genus G greater or equal to, then the size, the size of this automorphism group never exceeds 
to G plus 2. And this bound is achieved for any even G. The size of uh, cyclic group uh, acting harmonically with given number of fixed points was estimated from above in our joint paper with Gramatsky in the 2019. I will talk more precisely about all these results. This is just a kind of introduction. I should say, and this is very important thing, that main technique of the present paper is the uniformization theory of graphs and their coverings. This theory was developed in papers of Jean-Pierre Serre, uh, uh, Professor Bass and Professor Kulkarni, and also uh, by my collaborators from Siberian team. Recall that uniformization theory of Riemann surfaces were developed in classical works by Riemann, Poincaré, and Kobe. Uh, let G be a final group acting harmonically on a graph of general G and the uh, factor graph under such an action is provided by the signature, which is uh, shown here on the screen. In what follows, we suppose that uh, all vertex stabilizer of group G are cyclic group. This is just for simplicity. In general, we can do this in more general stuff. Okay, now, now, now again, uh, some very uh, important things coming from uniformization theory. In this case, we have to do one very important thing. We have to change the category of graphs as an object to category of graph of groups. So in my case, I will use two kinds of notation. Uh, X is just a graph. X calligraphic is a graph of groups. Uh, I try to explain what this means in very simple examples. But first of all, I denoted by X calligraphic just a graph of groups which is obtained from X by prescribing to each vertex of this graph a trivial group and to each age of this group also a trivial group. So nothing happens, but it's just uh, element from the another category. Now we consider a graph G, uh, graph Y, and graph Y uh, which in my notation is supposed to be just a factor of X by action of G. Ah, oh, 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 sorry for this. No, 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 something there is wrong. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, consider a graph of groups uh, which can be obtained in more serious way. Now to each vertex, we prescribe a cyclic group of the respective order. Uh, uh, now, if we have a map between two graphs, uh, I suppose that is a very special kind of map so this uh, branch covering of graphs and branch orders of uh, this covering are exactly these numbers which are respectable for the signature. Now I want to extend a branch covering of graphs to the covering of graph of groups. In this case, I am able to talk about the fundamental group of graph of groups in both cases. And also I can say something about universal covering of this graph. Uh, probably, probably it's good idea to draw something. Let's try to draw if it's possible. Uh, I could try uh, well. Let's 
I cannot see some instruments here. Oh, 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 sorry. Really sorry. I cannot find to draw something. It's very strange. Usually it exists every time. I can share to something to draw. Uh -huh, now it is. Okay, could you see a new screen or not? Yeah. Just just empty one, yeah? Yeah. MDS. Great, great. Now I am able to draw some pictures. Of course, I start just very simple pictures. So we have a star graph, for example. This star graph is formed by five ages. This is our X, the standard X, just a standard graph. Of course, all vertices of the graph are also present here. This is nothing serious, just a graph. Now I want to consider more or less standard cyclic action of the group Z5. As a result, I have graph which consists only on one edge. And also I have a branch point of order five, which is projection of the central point of our graph. Is it understandable, the action of this group? This is just rotation. So how we do it in the Riemann surface theory, this is pi over five rotation only. Uh, is it understandable this picture? Okay. Yes. So this is graph Y, factor by action of our group. Now I want to change a category of our object. So this means that I prefer to deal with the graph of groups. Uh, visually, visually is almost the same, but the difference is uh, just the following. To each vertex of our graph, I have to prescribe a group. In this particular case, I want to prescribe just cyclic group of order one. I just used one. Cyclic group of order one, trivial group. Trivial group. And also the same can be done to any age. So this is just a standard procedure, how to change category of graphs to the category of graph of groups. So the first object is from theory of graphs. The second object is from the theory of graph of groups. In the second case, situation is a bit more delicate. Now I want to use why calligraphic like this. But now I have to change a prescribing of vertices. To the outer vertex, I still prescribe a one, but to the branch point, I want to prescribe a cyclic group of order five. So we have a graph of group again. Now the covering we start with, cyclic covering with the group Z5, is extended to the covering of graph of groups. Okay, what are good news in this case? The good news are the following. I am able to introduce the notion of the fundamental group of graph of groups. In the case of Y, it is quite important 
because according to the general theory, in this case, I have to create a special group which is responsible uh, for structure of all before fundamental group. It, this is just a free product of two cyclic. One cyclic is trivial one, and the second is cyclic group of all the five. Of course, this is nothing, just Z5 itself. So this means that in our theory, additional group appeared, namely the fundamental group of our uh, graph of group Y. In the case of X, nothing happens with fundamental group because we prescribe to each vertex of our group just trivial one we have that fundamental group of graph of groups is still trivial one. No, in any case, we have a difference between fundamental group of these two guys. Uh, now, now I want to be back. I try to be back. I don't know, is it easy or not? I am back or still in the same place as Bo. Could we see the text? Yeah, uh, the slides. What? Slides are not yet here, and the same uh, whiteboard we can see. Aha, uh -huh, whiteboard, whiteboard. Okay, so this means just I need a new, a new demonstration. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Так, now, is it lecture? Yes. Uh -huh, is it lecture? No, well, this is exactly what is written on this slide. We start with the map of graphs x to y. And this map is naturally extended to the uh, covering of graph of groups. Now, this is combination of the combinatorics coming from graphs and also combination of group theory, because to each vertex of our group, we prescribe a particular finite group. As a result, we are able to define the notion of fundamental group of this object. Uh, each graph of group admit a special kind of universal covering. In my case, this is X calligraphic with tilde and Y calligraphic with tilde. These are respectively universal covering of graphs. In the Riemann surface theory, if we deal with the Riemann surfaces of genus greater than one, every time we have the same universal covering. This is just unit disk. In the case of graphs, the situation dramatically changed. Each particular graph has its own universal covering. And this universal covering can be never coincide. But we are lucky in situation if we deal with branch covering. More precisely, by the uniformization theorem done by Bus in his paper in the 1996, uh, uh, there exists a lift uh, of our map phi to the map phi tilde between universal covering. And this lift is equivalent on the action of delta on the group uh, G on X and Y respectively. More precisely, this means that we are able to recognize our graphs, our graph of groups as a factor of universal covering by action of fundamental group. This is fundamental group for the first graph X and this gamma is fundamental group for the second graph. Now, uh, now, uh, very important things that if we start with branch covering of the graph, which is every time the case uh, when we deal with the regular covering, uh, then universal covering of this graph are indeed isomorphic. So we are lucky. The universal covering of X and Y is the same. After identification via this isomorphism, we can replace 
our covering by the covering uh, which is quite common in the Riemann surface theory. So now X and Y both share the same universal covering S wave. The first graph is just factor X wave by delta. And the second graph is the factor on the same graph X wave by gamma. Recall that delta every time is subgroup, uh, subgroup of Y. So this means that the covering of the consideration is indeed induced by group inclusion. And if we start with the regular covering as before, then the factor group of this uniformizing group is exactly our group G. This means from this point, we are able to forget about graphs at all. We are dealing only with groups, gamma and delta. One of this group is uh, subgroup in the another one and also normal subgroup and the factor group of the respective uh, two groups is exactly the covering group of uh, our uh, covering. Uh, this is a more or less general statement. Of course, uh, if it will be more time, I can explain this is more precisely. Uh, many people probably ignore this uniformization theorem by bus when they deal with the different graphs because it's a bit complicated. But in the case of uh, harmonic action of groups, it became just a very simple. In this case, both graphs, graph we start to deal with X and factor graph Y share the same universal covering as a graph of groups. And we are able to describe our covering in terms of group action on the same universal covering. I should say that universal covering every time is a simply connected graph, but it may be very big graph in general, but we are lucky because it's the same for both of graphs. Okay, now I try. Uh, uh, we know that the signature of our all before, this is a factor all before indeed, uh, by definition was just gamma M1 and so on and N. Hence, by bus paper, we are able to find a algebraic structure of the group delta. This is a free product of uh, G uh, cyclic groups. Uh, 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 and also gamma in our consideration is just a, a graph which can be shown here. Well, probably I again should uh, change the uh, situation to the uh, to the to the to the uh, my previous slide if it possible Tak. Tak. I cannot find Tak. Yes. let me see so I want to be back Tak. Tak. so you can see this one yeah now now uh, what is universal covering of this star graph? Because graph is simply connected, universal covering both for these graphs is the same as X. So this in some sense is a very simple situation. The reason is that our graph has no loops. Otherwise the universal covering is infinite and we have a serious problem. Now, probably I want to show this situation in more, more, more general case. Now I want just uh, yeah, uh, to try to draw a more general situation. So we start with general graph. 
we can see the, the action of group G, which acts harmonically on our graph. Then the factor graph is well defined because of harmonic action. This factor graph in my notation is uh, denoted by gamma. As before, as before, we are able to prescribe a signature, a signature of this covering. Here, branch order are just order of stabilizer of our group, in particular vertices. So this was exactly the definition of signature before. This is uh, coming from the graph theory. There are no graph of groups. Now I want to change a situation. In what way? I want to consider a graph of groups. In this situation is nothing. This is just X with trivial stabilizer. This trivial stabilizer. Trivial stabilizers. So it's essentially the same as it was before. But in case of Y, situation is different. Now we can see the graph Y as it was before. This stabilizes to the vertices, which are responsible exactly for the branch covering. So if branch order at the point was M1, we prescribe to this point the cyclic group of order M11. If the branch point was of order MR, we prescribe another one. Another one, so M1. Well, probably it's a good idea to draw something. Uh, how we can do this. Uh, for example, we have a graph. We have a graph which has six edges and we also have a graph which has a, uh, three edges. So totally, totally this is supposed to be a graph X. It's disconnected in this case, but in general, this is not so important. Now I want to consider the action of group Z3 on both of graphs. Then as a result, as a result, in the first case, in the first case of the factorization, of the factorization, I have a graph which is just consists of two edges. And in the second case, I have to consider a graph which consists of an edge. Uh, what happens with branch indices? This point and projection of this point create a branch index of order three. And again, in the second case, we're able to create a branch order of order three. Uh, this all description of branch points. So this is X in my consideration. And uh, the second one, the second one is supposed to be a factor graph. A factor graph. Так, ладно. A factor graph. Now I want to describe the same on the language of graph of groups. What happens in this case? Nothing serious happens. I have to change just this to cyclic group. Z3 and Z3 in both cases. I have to prescribe the unit cyclic group to all remaining vertices. And also the same should be done for covering graph. So this is a picture. This is a picture of graph of groups, which are coming from the, our consideration of branch covering. Again, this is a one, this is a one, one and one more. Well, so in this case, again, if we are looking for the fundamental group of our graph, this is just a free product, free product of two cyclic groups of order three. 
This is a fundamental group of uh, our uh, our graph, uh, which is uh, sitting below, and uh, mm, we have to say something like in this manner. This is more or less general situation, but of course, in general, we have a lot of branch point. They may be of different uh, nature. Uh, uh, but in our case, we have just described situation. Okay, now I tried, and now I tried to be back. I hope it will be done successfully. Done back again. Okay. Так, could you see the slides? Yes, we can see the slides. Yes. So this is just description. This was example. In general, there are loops. We have gamma, which is responsible exactly for number of loops. And it's produced extra uh, free multiple. Z to the free power gamma. So this is just a free product of gamma copies of this. And uh, of course, in general, universal covering of our graph may be very, very, very large. Uh, following tradition in the Riemann surface theory, see, for example, Magbis paper, one can refer to gamma as universal covering group of orbifold, of orbifold. So for Riemann surface, universal covering every time is fixed point free and also consists of elements of infinite order. For orbifold, the universal covering group has element of finite order and then are also present here. Okay, now, uh, now I want to produce some graph theoretical version of two well-known Moore theorem ruled by Moore in the 1970s. First, uh, I want to start with some result which I used to give a simple proof of Moore theory we need. The result is following. This is a part of Riemann surface theory. Let S be a compact Riemann surface. And Z sub N is a cyclic group of conformal automorphism of S. Denoted by gamma M1, M2, the signature of factor uh, surface or just signature of orbifold. Consider a subgroup of cyclic group of order G. Then the all default signature of the factor space X by CD is the following. Now, the first parentheses are responsible for greater common divisor and the another parentheses are impossible for lower common multiple. So we have two kinds of action. The first is action of cyclic group of order N on the Riemann surface S. And the second is action of subgroup of this group ZD on the same Riemann surface. Because group is smaller, the signature is supposed to be changed in some way. So this theory indeed describes just a behavior of branch point of this particular coverage. Uh, the Moore theorem, which will be mentioned later, give us also a description of genus for such factor graph. This was done a long time ago, and now my aim is to do the same for graphs. And also I prefer to give a proof of this theorem in the graph case. Okay, theorem, let X be connected finite graph and Zn is a cyclic group acting harmonically on it. Denote as usual by gamma, etc. the signature of all before. Consider a subgroup of our group of order n. Then the signature of all before, which obtained by factorization of x by subgroup has uh, the following structure. Again, the first parentheses are for greater common divisor and the second for our common multiple. 
essentially we have the same style of assertion. But now, of course, the Riemann surface is changed by graph. Now I want to indicate the proof of this theory. Well, let's we consider the universal covering of the all before graph. By the above mentioned result, the structure of universal covering group is just the following three products. It's completely responsible for the structure of signature of our or before. Uh, moreover, if we factorize the universal covering by action of such a group gamma, we have exactly subgraph or, or before the isomorphic to O. Such gamma is the universal covering group of our or before. Uh, uh, we consider uh, the or the preserving epimorphism from the group gamma to cyclic group, which is exactly responsible for the description of our action, of our action of cyclic group of this graph. Kernel of this graph is a free group of G, where G is genus of our graph. Now, we fix this epimorphism and consider the pro-image under this epimorphism of the subgroup of what they do. Uh, we note that uh, all default O and all default OG, which is obtained by factorization by cyclic group of ODG, subgroup indeed, share the same universal covering. This is a good news. So we have to identify the second or default with the factor uh, of universal covering by action of the H, where H is subgroup in gamma. Indeed, a torsion free subgroup of gamma of the finite index uh, in our group gamma. So we have a sequence of all defaults covering, universal covering, graph obtained by action of subgroup of order D and original graph obtained by action of cyclic group of order N. And this action is induced by group inclusion. This is identity group. This universal covering of the all default OOD is this universal covering of O. One can easily calculate the indices of this subgroup. In our case, these indices are just N OOD. Thus, the number uh, of uh, the, uh, this index also coincides with the multiplicity of our current Q. This is easy to understand from this diagram. In such a way, each H of O has prescribed N over D pre images in O over D. Now we consider the vertex, the vertex of O over D. Uh, the branch index of all defaults is equal to the size of stabilizer for any pre-image of this. This was exactly the definition of all default uh, signature. In the same time, branch order in the point Q of X uh, coincides uh, with this side. Avoiding point this trivial stabilizer, we can assume the stabilizer is MG for some mg from the signature of our or default. We recall the stabilizer of our action every time it's cyclic group of suitable or the mg. Now, now we consider the image of this subgroup and the action of our epimorphism. Uh, when we consider the restriction of this epimorphism to cyclic group of order d. Since Epimorphin preserves the order of elements. We have that uh, uh, structure of stabilizer is exactly cyclic group of order, which is greater common divisor of Mg and G. So each element in the preimage of Y of N over two fold covering Q Hence, branch order, which equal to the greater uh, greater common divisor of these two numbers. 
notice that there are exactly such number of such a point. This exactly is a proof of how we see it. This is the order of branch point. This is the number of branch point for this prescribed order. So theorem is proof. Now I want to apply this uh, particular theorem to two or three very important assertions. The first consequence of the above results is the following discrete version of the Moore formula, well known in the Riemann surface theory. See, for example, Moore paper or Bagby's paper. This statement is the following. Let G be a cyclic group acting harmonically on a graph and uh, uh, H be an element of order D, where D is greater than one in the same cyclic group. Denote by this vector the signature of all befalls under consideration. Then the number of fixed points on this particular automorphism is given by the following formula. We have to pass through all uh, uh, branch orders which are multiple of D and consider the sum of the corresponding quotients. For Riemann surfaces, this was done a long time ago, but now we have also a proof for the graph case as a consequence of the above theorem. Okay, now, 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 now. This is exactly the proof of the statement. We already know the signature of all befalls, which appeared by action of the uh, cyclic group of order two. Again, we can see the an arbitrary point of all befalls and pre-image of this point. Uh, since the covering is regular, the group ZD acts transitively on the pre-image of X. So the fiber X sub X can contains a fixed point uh, of H if and only if it consists of one element. This is easy calculation. If X is an ordinary point, that is branch point of all the field, the fiber, fiber X consists of D elements and so has no fixed point of H. Accordingly to the signature of our all before, which was described in the previous theorem, we have exactly this number of branch points of all the greater common device on D. The fiber of such a point has length one if and only if the following condition is satisfied. But this condition is exactly equivalent to the condition that D is a, a device of MG. As a result, we are able to calculate the number of fixed points by the following formula. This is exactly the statement of Moore theorem, but now for graphs. Okay, uh, the consequence, one more consequence of the same theory. Again, if we consider a cyclic group acting harmonically on a graph and consider the signature of the respective fac factor uh, graph, then the number of fixed points of generator of this group coincide with the number of entries MG, which coincide exactly with M. So this gives a very simple way to calculate the number of uh, fixed point for the aftermorphism if we know the signature of factor or before. In this way, we are able to find the following statements. Uh, uh, the first one uh, describe uh, us the case when the cyclic group is acting on the graph and has at least one fixed point. Uh, you remember then in uh, the case when we have the maximal possible order of cyclic group, namely G to G to G plus two, this is the case of Wiemann bound. We have no fixed point at all. Now we are looking for situation when we have fixed point. This is the first situation when this happens. More precisely, if we consider a graph of genus greater or equal than two and cyclic group acting harmonically, 
Uh, and suppose uh, that generator of this group has at, at least one fixed point. Then upper bound for the order is just two G. The upper bound is extend if and only if the factor all before has the signature zero to two G. This means that the factor all before is a tree with two branch points of order two and order two G. Because the number of fixed points coincides with the order n, we have that we have maximum only one order in this case. Uh, generalization of this theorem is given by the second theorem. If we consider again the graph of genus G greater or equal to and cyclic group acting harmonically, and suppose that generator of this group has at least two fixed points, then the upper bound for the size of this group is this one, one plus G over K minus one. The upper bound is achieved for arbitrary G and K for which G over K minus one is integer. Maybe you remember that the similar result for Riemann surfaces was mentioned before. It was the result of Gregor Gramatsky for the case of Riemann surfaces. The constant was slightly different, but the situation is essentially was the same. But now we have the same, the similar statement for graph as well. So kind of resume, kind of resume. If we have a cyclic group acting harmonically on graph of genus G, then by Wieman theorem, order is bounded from above by 2G plus 2. The bound, upper bound is attained only for even G. In this case, the signature of all default is 0 or 2G minus 1. This means that we have a tree with two branch points of order 2 and G minus 1 respectively. Because G plus 1 never coincide with G2 plus 1, we have no fixed point in this case. Uh, moreover, if N is strictly less than this upper bound, then we have at, at most two G elements in our group. The upper bound 2G is again attained. In this case, the signature is 2G plus 2. In this case, uh, we have two possibilities. Or n is equal to 12, or all defaults has a signature O is 3, 4. The third possibility, the third largest possibility for the cyclic group is attained for the number n equal to g minus 1. It appears only in two cases, for n3 and all default uh, of signature O three three and for n equal fifteen and all before of the signature O three three. In the sex in the next section we describe the number of fixed points of the astromorphism generating the above mentioned groups, the three largest possible size, namely G two G plus two, two G and two G minus one. What happens in this case? This is just a result recently published in my paper in the Siberian Electronical Mathematical Report. Professor Magnus. Yeah, yeah, sure. It is, yeah. It is one I, hour, I, but you can take maybe 10 minutes because time was lost. In, in so I have to finish, yeah? Yeah, in maybe 10 minutes. Next. How many minutes I have? 10, 10. Oh, it's more than enough. No problem. Okay, thank you. So, in this case, we have a possibility to describe the cyclic action with maximal possible size, namely 2G plus time. As it was told before, T is act on graph without fixed point. How to prove this? More or less easy, because we know also the signature of this or default by proposition. Uh, the number of fixed point uh, of our uh, element T is exactly the uh, number of elements MG, which are equal to N. But there are no such elements. We can easily analyze all possible situations. If genus is uh, equal to zero, we have strictly inequality. N is greater than two. Uh, and also in the next case, n is greater than g plus one. So it never happens that mg coincides with the size of our group. 
or in the other words, our group acting without fixed point. So this is the first result. And the second result describe a cyclic group of order 2G. This is the second possible maximum order of action. Then if N is not equal to 12, the automorphism has only one fixed point. If N is equal to 12, then either T has only one fixed point or X fixed point three on our graph. Indeed, according to the, our version of the Wiemann theorem, in this case, we have only two possibilities for the signature. This is the one possibility for the signature. This is the second one. In the first case, uh, when n is not equal to 12, uh, we have only one possibility, namely this one. This means that uh, we are responsible only for one fixed point of our uh, group action. In the second case, three and four are different from six, easy to see. Uh, so we have no fixed point in this situation. So all uh, structure of fixed point for this particular cyclic group are described by this theory. And now the last situation, we have the third possible size of cyclic group, namely the size 2G minus one. Then T uh, has two fixed point or X fixed point three on our graph. In the first case, the genus is just two, and the second genus is just eight. Very few possibilities. Indeed, by the discrete version of the Virium theorem, in this particular case, when n coincides with 2g minus one, we have only three possi two possibilities for signature. The first is O33. Three, three. Easy to see that three does not coincide Ah, it is easy um, uh, to see that three exactly coincide with N. Two G minus one in this case is three. So all these three are responsible for fixed point. We have two fixed points in this situation. In the second case, we have quite big genus. So this means that order of our group is two times eight minus eight, so 15. But 15 does not coincide with three and doesn't coincide with five. So we have no fixed point in this situation. This is exactly the proof of our theory in this particular case. And now just examples. Of course, uh, slides will be sent to everybody. You can easily analyze this situation. This is a cyclic group of the maximum possible order. It's uh, just a... Uh, uh, coming from the bipartite graph. This is a cyclic action of the group uh, of the second possible size. And again, we can easily consider the picture in more details after they can be said. And the third situation, these two particular cases, 12, again, full description of such an action is given by the substitution and the by graph. And the one more possibility also is described very, very precisely. Okay, now the last subject, this is so-called hyperelliptic graphs. Graph is said to be hyperelliptic, it is two-fold branch covering over three. The corresponding covering is called the hyperelliptic involution. This is a picture of our graph. Sorry for this Russian, this is means just semi-H. Same age. This is particular um, case of graph action. Now some theorem. Consider the automorphism group of uh, graph G, denoted by H sub one and H O uh, one, the gomology and cogomology of our group. Uh, the action of automorphism on the gomology and cogomology will be denoted in the respective way. Then the following result has a place. Suppose that G is arbitrary to H connected graphs. This means that uh, there are no H rotation in this graph. And tau is uh, automorphism of our group. Then the following assertion is equivalent. G is hyperelliptic graph with the hyperelliptic involution tau. 
the action of this uh, group x by multiplication by minus one. Sorry, there is a misprint. And the action of the cohomology group is again multiplication by minus one. So every time this action reverse uh, elements of our homology or cohomology group. Similar result is well known in the Riemann surface theory. I already asked it Krishnandu. He says, no, this is not his result. But maybe Professor Kulkarni remember. Some of his students published a paper where the similar result was proved for Riemann surface case. I saw the paper, but very unfortunately, I don't remember now the result. So this is multiplication by minus one, and also here is the multiplication by minus one. This is a characterization of hyperelliptic involution in the case of graphs as well in the case of Riemann surfaces. And now one more possibility uh, to find the discrete version of the Farkas and Robert Akala theorems for Riemann surfaces, of course. If we consider double unbranched covering of graph G of genus two, then this unbranched covering is always hyperelliptic graphs. And one more theory, consider a three-sheeting unbranched covering of a graph G of genus two. If this covering is irregular, then it certainly is hyperelliptic. If this covering is regular, then it has a double branch covering over torus to now a case of graph of genus two. So similar results are well known in Riemann surface theory, and now they are proved also for graphs. It's very surprising, but this two theorem also take a place for three-dimensional manifold. This is joint result of mine with my collaborators from it. Okay, and now more or less uh, the last topic. Uh, the graph is called a hyperelliptic if it's two branch covering of a genus G graph. The following theorem was proved in our paper in 2016. Let G be a connected graph of genus C. Consider an evolution acting free on the state of directed edges of E. Denoted by T with a star, the induced action on the first gamology group. Suppose that T has at least one fixed vertex, then the following condition are equivalent. The genus of factor graph is gamma. Uh, there is a basis in the gamology group of the graph whose G elements are either invertible or split in the gamma interchangeable pair on the action of this uh, aftermorphism. And the next, the trace of this element when it's realized by matrices in the first gamology group is exactly two gamma minus G. In the case when tau X fixed point three, these general are related by the Schreier formula, which of course is just a version of the well-known Riemann for Riemann Gurwitz formula for the graph. So this is description of gamma hyperelliptic uh, graphs and their covering involution. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Magnik, for a nice talk. It looks very amazing how whole Riemann surface theory has been developed in graph theoretic setting. Anyone has any questions here? Yeah, one question is that uh, these are very recent results, uh, 2019 and 2021, like that. These are. Which uh, result you mean? I mean, this. So here we are considering action of a cyclic group on uh, a Riemann surface or a graph, a finite connected uh -huh. graph. So is there any study of some other uh, groups like dihedral groups and yeah. so on, uh, which is being done in the literature after this study of uh, action of yeah, for sure, for sure, you can change the statement to the diagonal group, then for uh, solvable group, for uh, abelian group as well. There are many results in the Riemann surface theory, you are right. All of them supposed to have a discrete analogous in graph theory as well. It takes just time. 
The technique is already done. The technique consists of uniformization theory, first I mentioned it, and also of the few version of the riemann gurwitz formula, which were done in my previous lecture. Mm -hmm. The technique is done. We need just people who are interested in this and just produce the respective theorem as well. Yeah, because non-abelian groups, etc., they will uh, be very difficult to handle, I think, in this situation. Uh, non-abelian. Uh, oh, sooner or later, sooner or later, we avoid graphs. We mm -hmm. are dealing only with groups itself. This is more easy. Mm -hmm. Groups, uh, epimorphism of groups. And if in the case of Riemann surface, every time we have some extra relation, like a product of commutative is equal to one. Oh. Here, all groups are just a free product of cyclics. This means oh. just much more easy to deal with. Similarly, far in Riemann surface correspond to the function group are also free products of cyclics. This is more of a similar situation. So the technique is already done. The technique is already there and one has to work. Uh, yeah. So uh, thank you very much. Yeah, it was nice. Yeah. Join us, yeah. Okay, welcome. Hello, anyone. Uh, have any questions for this talk? Professor uh, Kulkarni? Let me, let me just say that I uh, he asked a question whether Krishna Hindu and or I had done something on that hyperelliptic involution. I at least now I do not remember anything that I have done this. So maybe some other others uh, student of mine may have done something. Maybe I tried to find, but it was like five years ago. I really don't remember. I, I saw the paper. Probably it's even even in my computer. But how to find it? it was it? What, what, what is the name? What the name? What if I know the name, there's no problem yeah. to fight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the reason was my suggestion was that. Was it Anthony Weber? Ah, what? Uh, was the author was Anthony Weber? Really, I not understand exactly your question. Mm -hmm. on... was guessing, guessing the author. He's saying that name of author could be Anthony Weaver, A N T H O N Y. Yeah, no, Weaver deal is only Riemann surfaces. So, yeah, no, maybe Anthony Weaver, maybe uh, right. So, but was it was that, also uh, somebody from somebody from India for sure was in this uh, list of authors. <laughs> so was it uh, for sure? Is, you remember the journal. Sure. You remember the journal? No. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> so, so was it this paper which I have shared is called hyper elliptic surfaces and their moduli? I mean, uh, no, maybe, maybe, but I'm not sure. Not sure. No, well, if somebody helped me to find, of course, I'd be very thankful yeah. for this. But sure, it was uh, a mathematician from India. Maybe together with some other people, but at least one other was from India for sure. Yeah, it's a very interesting direction in uh, demand surface theory and graph theory that you're working on. Uh, you should write some book on this. <laughs> I yeah. with you, but how to find the time, maybe you know a secret. <laughs> if you know the secret, please tell me. Yes. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there are um, a few more subjects which are also waiting for the book <laughs> from me. <laughs> but, well, I hope, I still hope, of course. Yeah, I agree. This now we have more or less a complete set of results. So it's a good subject for kind of monograph. Oh, I think uh, 
it could be the paper by Kashyap Rajiv Sarathi. Uh, could you send just by chat? Because I not understand exactly the name. Could you put it in the chat? Yeah. Uh, Was this the author name? Maybe this is the author name. Because I think he was working on something related to hyper elliptic involution. So, so who can uh, tell us? I, I, I not understand the name, sorry for this. Yeah, I have to check. Uh, yes. I have to check. Yeah. Maybe Siddhartha Sharkar? No? No, no. Okay. I think it's the paper with Niran Dhawani Parnas. I oh. think. Hello, so if there is no more question, we can thank Professor Magnik again. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for your thank you. Thank you. Okay. So your next talk would be next Tuesday, Professor. Do you remember? Uh, no, yes, I remember. At least I have some notice from you. And yes, we you. have requested that he, previously we asked for two talks. But now, since there are well, I need some time to prepare my slide because I, I want to add some comments and so on, some literature. But maybe a few days I will send the slides. It's okay. No, it's okay. It's okay. I'm just talking about the next Tuesday's talk. So uh -huh. there would be uh, one talk by yourself at 4 p.m. So I have just and one more John talk. Carter. I can understand. Yeah. Ah, just one more talk on 4 p.m. Indian time, 5.30 your time. 21st September it is. I will remind you again in the due course. Yeah, yeah, just remind me later. Yeah, okay, ah. don't worry. Professor Parker, just join here. Hello, sir. Hello. Так, куда си? Ага, Джон Кроу. Hello, так, Sasha. I'm, I can't I'm, see I'm, you. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Professor Parker, did you see that my email about this covering of client surfaces and real algebraic? Yeah, yeah I, 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 I saw that. Yes. Um, so I've been anything? rather busy. I've had a, I've had a talk to write. Okay, okay, it's okay. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure whether that was the right. The, yeah, I, I, I didn't have a chance to look into that, but yes. Maybe you could send it to, to, to Sasha and see. Ah, I send him also actually. Yeah, yeah, very good. How are things there? Things are fine. It's a bit cold and wet at the moment. We had we had beautiful weather last week, and now it's turned a bit cold and wet. I see. Uh, but I, I mean, if I say cold, it's nothing to what to what Sasha has in the winter. Many years ago, Sasha came to visit me in Durham. Uh, yeah, and it was in January, yeah. and he came from what was a very cold winter for Siberia. Was it minus? Yeah, 55? it was minus fifty. We like this. <laughs> Yeah. So anything that I say is cold is is, is nothing compared to that. <laughs> this time Siberia was too hot, right? The summer was too warm this time. No, in Siberia. Oh, in, in Siberia. Ah, yeah. And I heard there were heat waves and things like that. Oh. Tomorrow it's supposed to be plus 20. I'm not sure. Today it was plus 6, but tomorrow plus 20. It's jumping, jumping. 
Very seriously jumping. Plus 10. Plus 6 was this morning. And tomorrow will be plus 20. Plus 20? Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, no, no, not so easy to predict. Maybe snow, maybe too many sun. Depends. But, but plus 20 means uh, pretty hot in your standard. No, just for one, two days. Don't worry, just for two days, maybe, not more. Okay, so I should also tell you that I have a meeting straight after my talk, so I will probably not be able to hang around too long for questions. So if that, and I will also try to finish on time this time. Okay. You can finish it 10 minutes early also, because I might not stay until the end of your talk as well for similar reasons. Okay, okay, fine. Yes, yeah, so I mean, uh, so shall we start uh, wait for five minutes? There is five minutes, so we can wait. We should start on time, actually. Yeah. Yes. So even though this is not a continuous session, right? I mean, these are we have to try to do the talk. Yeah. Say that again. Sorry. I have a, uh, asking Devendra that this is these are not continuous sessions, right? So you have divided into two talks, five, four to five, and five. No, no, it is meant continuous by some okay. So. We will try to divide the YouTube videos and share separately sometimes. That will be done if required later on. Not now. At yes. present, it is live streamed, and everybody will see these two lectures one by one. But later on, we can separate if required. That is what we discussed in the meeting. Second. Hi. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Are you there? Who are you asking? Vaibha, Vaibha is there. No? Oh, yeah, Vaibha, hi. No wish. Hi, hi, yeah. Missed the first talk. I, I was distracted. Other things, yeah. So, why have everything is settled now? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, settled is a, you know, it's a complicated word to use. Yeah, but yeah, settled. Yes. By pan. I think I think the presentation one can put up. I mean, because uh, now mm -hmm. four minutes are there, so uh, Professor Parker, you can share the slides. Maybe I'll share the slides, probably. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I'm starting to do that. Here we go. Can you see that? Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Yes. yes. So, John, you have really worked hard on your slides, 237 pages. Um, so, so the, the, the number at the top is the number of files I have in my, in my directory. That's nothing to do with the, the, the pages. So it would be some continuation from last talk, sir. Or? Uh, it's a separate talk, but I, I am going to slide. Well, I, okay. yeah, it, it's a separate talk.
maybe I will make a tiny bit of reference to something from last talk. Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. add a tiny bit of reference to something in the next talk. Whoops. Yeah, yeah. All right, so welcome back. So it's a pleasure to have uh, Professor John Parker again. So he will continue his series of lectures. And today he will be speaking about the hyperbolic plane, its isometries and triangle groups. So John, I over to you. Uh, okay, thank you very much. and. So this talk is again supposed to be some background for people who are attending uh, this uh, semester of, of uh, talks. Uh, I'm going to do some material that is very, very standard, but I'm also going to do things, uh, some other things that are again, fairly elementary, but in my own particular way. And you will, you will see what I'm going to do. So here's a plan of where we're going to have. I have a very brief prologue, which came out of uh, the last talk. And then I'm going to discuss the upper half plane model of the hyperbolic plane. I'm going to look at it on a, on a different viewpoint using Hermitian linear algebra. Then I'm going to discuss two more models of the hyperbolic plane. And finally, we're going to talk about hyperbolic triangles and triangle groups, which is one of the main themes of this session. And I'm hoping that this will give you at least a bit of background uh, so that you've probably already now seen triangle groups a couple of times. But first to the prologue. So this is specially for Professor Kulkarni. Last time he asked me about Millington. And so here is a slide mm. about Millington. Uh, so, mm. so her name, you know, she was born Margaret Hillary Ashworth. She married somebody whose surname was called, it was Millington. And so, so then that's what her name, she changed her name at that point. She was born on the 22nd of March in 1944. Uh, she did a BSc in Durham, uh, my own university. And according to uh, her obituary, it, what she, got, she scored something like double the amount of points needed to get a first class mark. And it was a uh, probably one of the best um, performances of any student uh, at that point, in, up to that point. So that's quite phenomenal. She then moved to Oxford for a DPhil. Uh, she moved to, she followed her husband, who was in the, I believe, the Air Force, and they moved to, the, to America. Uh, but while she was, she was there, um, she had a brain hemorrhage and unfortunately died um, short, shortly before her 29th birthday. Okay, and that is a picture of her. Thank you. So that Thank was, you. That's a prologue for, for Professor Kulkarni. Thank you. Let's go back to, to, to some very standard material. I think everything on this slide is completely standard. And you can find it in many, many books on hyperbolic geometry. So I'm going to have the upper half plane model of the hyperbolic plane. And I'm going to continue the same notation as last time. Uh, with, a, with a, a calligraphic U. So it's the set of points in the complex plane whose imaginary part is positive, And it has a metric, which I can write as ds squared is dz dz bar over the imaginary part of z squared. Or if you prefer, the x squared plus dy squared over y squared, if I'm writing it in x plus i y. Now, from the point of view of differential geometry, uh, we can write out the coefficients of the first fundamental form. And using uh, the theorem of Gregium, we can calculate the Gaussian curvature. And we see that that is constant of minus one. So this is one of the, uh, the constant curvature spaces. And so the sphere would have constant curvature plus one, that would be the unit sphere. 
the, the, the uh, Euclidean plane would have constant curvature zero, and the hyperbolic plane has constant curvature minus one. And that's one of the most powerful reasons why it's, it's heavily studied. And with this model of the hyperbolic plane, the, the group of orientation preserving isometries uh, is, the, is the group um, of Möbius transformations uh, with real coefficients and, and I can and positive determinant, and I can always assume that the determinant AD minus BC is equal to plus one. I can do that by scaling, uh, multiplying through top and bottom by a scalar. In addition, there are some orientation reversing isometries. That's going to come in later when we're talking about triangle groups. The simplest one would be reflection in the imaginary axis, which would be Z goes to minus Z bar. And then what I can do is I can apply uh, any of the other things, any of the Mobius transformations to get uh, something of the form B of Z is minus AZ bar plus B over minus CZ bar plus D. This is all completely standard. So geodesics, which are the, the shortest uh, paths, or the, um, uh, well, I'm going to do a special case here. Again, you can probably find this in Jones and Singerman. You can find it in many other, and Bearden. You can find lots of standard things. So I'm going to, I have the claim. The claim for this slide is that the imaginary axis is a, is a geodesic. That means that the, that the length of, a path, of an arc on the imaginary axis that length, the, um, the hyperbolic length of that um, is the same as the distance between the endpoints. So well, let's make, make this very concrete. We'll have a, pa a path uh, gamma from the unit interval to, to U. Um, we have a path with endpoints IP and IQ, where P is less than Q, are real numbers. And for the point, um, the point uh, on this line gamma of T, I, I will write it as x of t plus, um, my, my pen suddenly seems to not be working. That's great. There we go. Um, and now I've got the wrong, the wrong page. Sorry about this. Um, right, we're back on this right page and now my pen is working. Um, and so here, um, here we see x of t, y of t, which is the same as the thing that I've written up there. And I'm now obscuring it. Okay, so now what was the length from the previous slide? We see that the, the ds would be the square root of this. So, d, so this thing, if I do that, would give me the s element of arc length. So I have um, x dashed of c squared plus y dashed of t squared over y of t dt. I have to integrate between zero and one. And now I can, I, this quantity is always going to be greater than um, or greater than or equal to y dashed of t over y of t. And I get equality if and only if x mm -hmm. dashed of t is zero. And when I integrate up, I just see that this length is log q over log p, uh, log of q over p, sorry. And you can see if x dashed of t is zero, this, this, this would have to be zero always, and my tangent vector, I don't know if I these have a different color for my tangent vector now, my tangent vector would always have to point along the imaginary axis, maybe upwards or downwards, depending on the side of y dashed of t. Okay, and so, uh, and so then that the minimum path length uh, between IP and IQ is log Q over P. So now let's look about what happens in the general case. If I take any pair of points Z and W, that, then I can always find some A in this PSL2R, that would be AZ plus B over CZ plus D, where A to D are real numbers, so that Z get maps under A to IP, W maps to IQ. And now what happens, uh, so we know that the shortest path between IP and IQ lies on the imaginary axis. Now this map here is a Möbius transformation and some of the basic facts you learn in complex analysis is that maps lines and circles to line, lines and circles. It also, um, um, 
it also preserves angles. And so, and finally, it also maps the, the, uh, the real axis together with infinity to itself. So, so this line here must be the arc, goes to the arc of a circle, which is orthogonal. And so here we see that the geodesics are semicircles orthogonal to the axis. Again, that's very, very standard material. So now let's talk about the, how we do the distance in the general case. The first sentence is the same as on the previous slide. So we can all, for any point Z and W, we can always map them to the imaginary axis. And then if I, I'm going to let rho, this is something I learned from Bearden. and this seems a, a classical thing from com for complex analysts. Rho is the hyperbolic distance function. So we just saw that the distance between IP and IQ is log of Q over P. Now, I want to be able to write this in a, in a fashion that is going to be Möbius invariant so that I can say, find the distance between um, Z and W. So I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to write cosh squared of this distance over two. That seems like a very bizarre thing to do. It happens to work. So if I do that a little bit, if I plug in um, that cosh squared of, um, of, of log Q over P over two, I, I get this formula here. And then I want to remember that A of Z is IP, A of W is IQ, and then I can write it in this formula, in this way here. So I want to find in general, the, the distance between, uh, the cosh squared of the distance over two between Z and W. I know that A is an isometry, but this is something that we, where we claimed earlier on. So that's the same as the distance between AZ and AW, which was IPIQ. So I plug in the same formula that I had upstairs. I write A in, in terms of this AZ plus B over CZ plus D. I do a bit of simplifying. I use AD minus BC is equal to one. And I come down to this formula here which is, you'll notice, um, is, is very similar to the formula we had above. And so that gives me the general formula for a cosh squared of distance over two. Good. Okay, so now an important thing for us to do is to classify isometries. So I'm going to let A be this Möbius transformation in PSL2R, and I want to classify by fixed points. So suppose that Z naught is fixed by A. So this means that Z naught is A Z naught plus B over C Z naught plus D. Cross multiplying and gathering all the terms onto the left-hand side gives me this quadratic expression there. And if C is not equal to zero, I, I use the quadratic formula to get this expression. Okay, so you can see that there's something very special happens where, when a, D plus, a plus D squared is bigger than four, equal to four or less than four, because that's the, that gives me the different roots of my quadratic. So when A plus D squared is bigger than four, the term inside the square root is real. Both fixed points lie on the real axis, um, and that's great. And if I actually look at the case where where, where, where C is equal to zero, um, then, well, C equals zero. Remember, AD minus BC is equal to one. So C is equal to zero. If AD, A plus D squared is bigger than four and AD is one, then A cannot equal D. And so this immediately gives me that, that the, there's a, a unique fixed point on R together with infinity. And I, again, get two fixed points. On the other hand, if a plus d squared equals four, I only get a single root. I have a double, my, my quadratic becomes a perfect square. Uh, this term disappears and the term inside the square root disappears. <coughs> I only get one fixed point. That's a real number, that's fine. And in particular, when c is equal to zero, this means that a equals z is plus or minus one. And I see that the fixed point has to be infinity. <coughs> Excuse me. 
And finally, when a plus d squared is less than four, the term inside the square root becomes, uh, becomes negative. And so I get uh, a, a fixed point in the upper half plane, a unique fixed point in the upper half plane. And I also get a fixed point in the lower half plane. But as we're only thinking about the upper half plane and its boundary, the lower half plane is completely outside uh, our universe. And so, um, and so, and so we, don't, um, we, we don't bother about that. Right? So that gives me a classification of fixed points. These three cases are called hyperbolic, parabolic, or elliptic, respectively. I also want to, to look briefly at the orientation reversing isometries. So we have b of z was minus a z bar plus b minus o minus c z bar plus d. And a little bit of a calculation will show you that if a equals d, then b fixes the geodesic with that equation. So that it would be a, uh, the arc of a circle uh, with center uh, a over c and radius one over absolute value of c. On the other hand, if A is not equal to D, we, the, the equation for the fixed point would, would split into two uh, equations. It, one of them would tell me that the imaginary part of the fixed point would have to be zero, and the, and the, and the other equation would give me um, the, this, uh, this formula where you see we always have real roots because the, the term inside the square root is always real. So I fix two, exactly two points, and they like both lie on the boundary of, of the <coughs> plane. And they're called a reflection and a glide reflection, or a hyperbolic glide reflection, respectively. OK, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to give you a, an alternative viewpoint on everything I've just said using uh, Hermitian linear algebra. So far, what I've said is completely standard. Um, and, and you can find it anywhere. I think the next, or some, of, some parts of what we're having later on is, is maybe in my viewpoint. You can find it written up carefully in some lecture notes that I wrote uh, for the University of Vascular in Finland. And you can find those on my webpage. The book, it's called Hyperbolic Spaces. So I want to, to, to redo everything I've just said simply using Hermitian forms. Now, the philosophy, before I say too much, the philosophy that I'm thinking about, which is a philosophy that I learned from my PhD advisor, Alan Bearden, is you should always state things in the most general way and the most invariant way possible. You might do specialist calculations like we just saw for the geodesics where, where certain calculation becomes easier but if you write things in the most general way possible, then you, you don't have to do that calculation over and over again. And so what I want to be able to do is I want to look at other, um, hyperbolic plane using other Hermitian forms, um, but, um, and, and so uh, we'll see how that works in a second. So I'm going to, so remember a Hermitian form is rather like a quadratic form, except it's over the complex numbers. And rather than being given by a symmetric matrix, it's given by uh, what's called a Hermitian matrix, where if I, so it, the matrix should equal its conjugate transpose, its Hermitian transpose. So I have to not only transpose it, but I also have to complex conjugate. And so I'm going to choose uh, this particular Hermitian form here. Um, uh, which I can write in, in matrix language as, um, as W star HZ. Right? So, so Z and W are column vectors, Z1, Z2, W1, W2. W star is the Hermitian transpose. So I conjugate transpose W, and then I can write it like this. And somehow, for me, it's always traditional that the Emission form should be anti-linear in the second variable, which means I have to switch the order of Z and W in this form from there. Okay. Now, I want to talk about unitary matrices, which are the complex or the Hermitian analog of orthogonal matrices. So an element of SL2C is unitary with respect to any Hermitian form. 
if any two by two Hermitian form, i.e. it means it's in SU of H, S because it's supposed to have unit determinant. If and only if, uh, whenever I apply the, the, the matrix, uh, the value of the Hermitian form stays the same for every value of Z and W. Now this is a little exercise for you. So any students here want to do an exercise, you should plug this in um, to, to the, um, to the, this up, up there. So if I have A, I, this means that I should have A star A, H A is equal to H. And you can, if you do a little exercise uh, using that, you can show that in fact, the entries of A must be real. And so it lies in SL2R. Okay, so how do we go from, from this vector space uh, C2 down to the upper half plane and the Riemann sphere. Well, I'm going, I define a canonical projection on, on the uh, C2 without the origin by, by we just identify two vectors if they differ by a, a complex scalar multiple. In other words, I can write um, P of Z is Z1 over Z2, where if Z2 is, is zero, that means that I get P of Z, P of P, P, uh, P Z is infinity. And, and I want to go the other way around. So rather than thinking of every point that will project down to something in the Riemann sphere, I want to lift it to a unique point so I think this is probably a section through the projection, if I want to talk about that technically. So for any point um, in, in C, I take what I call the standard lift. It's the vector Z comma one in C2 and infinity, I take one zero. And you'll notice I never get the origin zero zero uh, as a standard lift of anything. And so, and you can tell that if I take the a point, I do the standard lift, and then I do projection, then I just have the identity map. Good. And now if Z is a standard lift of Z, then coming into this Hermitian form that we had earlier on, we would have W2 and Z2 being zero and W1 is equal to, to Z1. And so I see that my form becomes uh, Iz minus Iz bar, which is minus twice the imaginary part of Z. And so this means that if I look at V minus, which is the set of vectors in C2, so that Zz is negative, that that is exactly, the, that's equivalent to saying that the imaginary part of Z it's positive, that's coming from, from this formula. And so this, this means, uh, and, and the similarly for the, for the non-zero vectors that where I would, if I had ZZ zero, that would mean that that uh, imaginary part of Z is zero. So this means my upper half plane is P of V minus, the boundary is P of V zero and uh, and that is going to be a, a standard thing that we, we can use again and again for other Hermitian forms. So that's an, an invariant way of describing my hyperbolic plane. And finally, okay. notice that if A is in SUH, then it's going to act uh, on the upper half plane by I, I take this vector Z, I take its standard lift, I do a matrix multiplication, and I projectivize, and I obtain. Uh, the, the, the good old um, uh, Mobius transformation we had before. And I claim that that's going to be an isometry. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to, to rewrite the metric and the distance function, both of them solely in terms of the Hermitian form. And then because this, this matrix is unitary, it preserves the Hermitian form and therefore it preserves the metric. Okay, so remember that we had 
um, this was our, our metric and, and this was our distance function. How can we write those in terms of the Hermitian form? Well, a little, again, this is an exercise for the students. You can, <coughs> you can um, plug in the standard lifts and you discover that I can write it purely in terms of the Hermitian form. And now because they're both given in terms of the Hermitian form, any element of SUH is automatically an isometry. Now, I should also say that's dealt with everything in PSL2R. I haven't dealt with minus complex, uh, with, with the minus co complex conjugation, but um, it's not very difficult to see that again, that, that same thing, that thing is also an isometry. Good. So if I have any other Hermitian form, and it has to have indefinite signature because I need some, some negative vectors. So that's just, if you know what signature of a Hermitian form is, that will make sense. If it doesn't, you can um, learn about that. Then I can define a space PV with a metric distance and distance function given by the formulae above. And moreover, I can do that in higher dimensions. I can do it with other fields. Uh, this is a sort of a gateway to complex hyperbolic space, quaternionic hyperbolic space. Um, I can even do any dimensional real hyperbolic space using Clifford algebras. And again, this Hermitian form um, condition um, is exactly the same as the Alfors condition, for, if you know about that, and you can find details of that in my vascular notes. So let's, let's do it. This is an exercise of the Poincaré disk. So in this case, I'm going to take the Hermitian form to be the diagonal uh, 1, 0, 0, minus 1. Uh, just plugging in for my formula for the metric and the distance function, I get those formulae here, which is the same as the Poincaré metric on the, on the unit disk. If you look in Bearden or in Jones and Singerman or any other met, um, book on hyperbolic geometry. And I could have, from the viewpoint of the Riemann sphere, I could have mapped one to the other via the Möbius transformation, z minus i over minus i z plus one, because that, that gives me an isometry from the upper half plane to, to the unit disk. And again, that's an exercise. So, but that, because that's a Möbius transformation, geodesics have to be arc straight lines or arcs of circles, and they have to be orthogonal to the boundary. Now, in terms of our matrix interpretation, C corresponds to a Cayley transform of that form, and, and I can, can rewrite my Hermitian form. So that's it's just, a Cayley transform is just something that changes basis. So it's so just a change of basis. So, I, so the Hermitian form um, that we have here, H1, you, you, a little exercise will check that that's C, the C inverse star H C inverse. And if A is an SUH, then A, A1 conjugate like that is an SUH1. And actually, this is what the matrix looks like if I take my ABCD real. And you'll notice that's the usual thing where the, the diagonal elements are conjugates of each other and the off diagonal elements are conjugates of each other. The determinant is equal to one and the trace is equal to A plus D. Good. So now a little picture. As I said, geodesics uh, in the upper half plane, uh, they, they get mapped across. So this is supposed to be a little cartoon where this point, the, the point at infinity is supposed to come here. This point here is supposed to come here and so forth. But they all get moved across. Great. Let's do another model of the, of the hyperbolic plane. And this is the Klein-Beltrami disk. So now I'm going to, to um, I want to do this geometrically, moving from the Poincaré disk. So let's just come back and remember that this is what the Poincaré disk looks like here, and what geodesics look like. So the first thing I'm going to do is going to be done in two parts. 
I'm going to use this. This first picture is supposed to show the one on the left is supposed to show the unit disk as maybe the equatorial, um, the equatorial disk here. So I'm thinking of C as, as living around here. This is the unit sphere S2. And I do stereographic projection from the North Pole. And that's what those yellow lines are supposed to be. This point Z stereographically projects by, by you take the line through the North Pole and this point and it projects to the point on the, in this case, on the lower hemisphere. It's not hard to see that the, in, the, the unit disk will get mapped to the, the, um, the lower hemisphere and that the unit circle is fixed point wise. Stereographic projection is conformal and it maps arcs to, as lines to circle and lines to circles. And so what we see is that, that the geodesics, they become um, semicircles uh, in the lower um, hemisphere, uh, who, which lie in a vertical plane or a plane through the North Pole. And, and then what I want to do, that's, that's the first step, that was this uh, stereographic projection to the, to the lower hemisphere. And then I do a vertical projection uh, back onto the unit disk. And because these, the, these, um, these geodesics lay in vertical planes, the image are, images are straight lines. And if you chase this through, you'll see that the, we get the, this formula here to the point x plus i y in, in the unit disk. I'm thinking of the, the original unit disk as being in the complex plane and the other one as being in, the, in R2. So x plus i y goes to 2x over 1 plus x squared plus y squared, comma 2y over 1 plus x squared plus y squared. And you'll notice that if x and y lie on the unit disk, a unit circle, then they're fixed pointwise. Fixed pointwise by both of these maps. So they're fixed point wise by their composition. And same philosophy as before, I'm going to now use quadratic forms on column vectors in R3 to, to describe the, the, the Klein Beltrami disk. So now I'm going to think of quadratic, everything's going to be over reals now. So it's slightly easier than the Hermitian forms that we were dealing with before. So I'm going to take a quadratic form on column vectors in R3, which is given by the diagonal matrix 1, 1, minus 1. So that's just like the usual dot product, except I have a minus sign in front of the, the third term. And I'm going to say that A and SL3R, so real 3 by 3 matrices with unit determinant, is in SOQ, i.e. this is orthogonal with respect to Q. If, if Whenever I apply the matrix, the value of the quadratic form stays the same for all values x and y in R3. And again, very similar to the previous thing where we're doing the emission forms. Now I'm going to define a projection, a canonical projection from R3 minus the origin by, um, by two, um, two points are the same if they differ from each other by a real multiple. And so the image, when it, for, provided x3 is not equal to zero, now it has a single point at infinity, I have a circle at infinity, um, uh, but I, then I'm going to get x, x1 over x3, x2 over x3. And so that's going to give me an R2, which when I identify the boundaries is going to give me the real projective plane. And we want to have a local inverse or a section through this projection. So the standard lift of x, y, and r2 is the column vector x, y, comma, one. And you can see if I lift up and then project, then I get back to the identity. And if I plug this into the Hermitian form, then I'm going to get x squared plus y squared minus one. And so negative vectors are indeed, uh, the, the, this is the same as x squared plus y squared is less than one and the bound, boundary circle is x squared plus y squared equals one. Great. So now, can I, now I want to write the hyperbolic metric and the distance function in terms of these, this quadratic form. 
And probably the, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you the answer and then we're going to, to check it. That just seems to be the easiest way. I tried to think of a clever way to, to, um, to, to, to just sort of move it across, which we probably could do. Okay, so let X and U be standard lift, lifts of X, Y, U, V. And I'm going to, so, th so this is supposed to be X, Y, 1, and this is supposed to be U, V, 1. So I'm going to define the metric and distance function by, and I think I've missed a minus sign out here. That should be a minus sign. Um, by, by something that looks very similar to the previous formula. So you can just forget what's on the right-hand side, but just on the left-hand side here. It's the same formula, except I've replaced my uh, Hermitian form with a quadratic form. My, or my Zs have gone to Xs. Uh, but the big factor is I do, before I had a four here. And I do not have that four. And similarly for the distance function, I had a two. I do not have that two. Uh, I could give you a bit of a, um, heuristic as to as to why that is true, but maybe in the interest of time we'll press on. And so if I plug the, the if I um, oops, if I come back to to this emission this quadratic form on the previous page, um, and I erase my square line there, then I, I a little again this is an exercise. Be working well today. Um, an exercise here, you find those formulae. And we note this missing factor of two or two squared compared to the earlier metrics. Now I claim that the that this gives me the, uh, something that is, I, ah, what's happened there? It gives me something that is isometric to the um, to the to the to the hyperbolic metric we saw before, and so here's a little thing that you need to check. So this this left hand side, this is cosh squared rho of um, well I say x u. That's cosh, not cosh squared. Where I'm using, where I, I'm saying that, that, that maybe five, I should say maybe uh, write it like this. Sorry, that's cosh. I have this map phi already defined, so I can say that this is phi of x phi of u. And then this on the right hand side. This is two cosh squared rho of x u over two minus one. And, and so if I were to plug, if I were to plug this formula for, uh, for the x y into this formula here and do a bit of simplifying, uh, I actually take the square root because that because it turns out to be easier. I get this long, horrible expression there. But then a little bit of simplifying, it's not very difficult, will, will tell me that it comes down into this, uh, this form here, which is what I need it to be. So that's my proof that the klein beltrami metric and the upper half plane metric are the same. And again, I can work out what happens to isometries. I have A, B, C, D in the upper half, uh, in PSL 2R there, and I map across to um, uh, using this, this map phi, then I get a matrix here. This is an S, O, Q. And you will notice that, that the, its trace is equal to a plus d squared uh, minus one. 
And so that's quite curious. That means that I'm only getting things whose trace is uh, bigger than or equal to minus one. What's going on? Well, the answer is that the orientation reversing elements also go to SO, SOQ. And here the trace is going to be, I think it's minus A minus D squared minus one. And so they have traces less than or equal to minus one. And so, so I, I'm seeing that in SOQ, this is it's sort of one slightly better than the than PSL2R because I have both orientation preserving and orientation reversing isometries just given by matrices there. So that's quite a good, good thing. And in particular, remember what in this second case when A equals D, I'm supposed to get a reflection fixing a geodesic and then you can see that it's the geodesic in that line. That's just a little, again, another exercise to check that. Good. So that was my three different models of the hyperbolic plane, the upper half plane, the Poincaré disk, and the klein beltrami disk, and, and, and how if you use uh, permission forms or quadratic forms, then you can do things in an invariant way and you can pass formulas across from one to the other. Why are we doing this? In this uh, whole, the, all these lectures, we're going to be interested in tri triangle groups. And so I want to first of all tell you what a hyperbolic triangle is before I tell you what triangle groups are. So a hyperbolic triangle is a region in the hyperbolic plane bounded by three geodesics. Uh, or geodesic arcs, uh, which are called the sides of the hyperbolic plane, the hyper side, the sides of the triangle. And um, well, we could have we could have a picture that looks like this, where my three geodesics are a long way away from each other, or if you prefer, in the upper half plane, uh, like that. Or I could even go do some, something even more bizarre, where they're sort of nested. But I want them to intersect. Uh, inside or to have common endpoints. And these common endpoints will be called vertices. So, so I do not want, I do not want pictures like that. Instead, I want pictures that look like this. But do that very well. Can try again. With vertices where they intersect uh, and so forth. We'll see some more pictures on the next page. Now the angle at each vertex is the angle between the tangent vectors to the sides when we're using the upper half plane or the Poincaré disk model. It is not true in the klein beltrami disk with the exception of the origin. Um, and so, well, we've seen one way where the klein beltrami is better. This is a way in which the Poincaré and the upper half plane are better. I claim that the area of a triangle is given by pi minus the sum of the interior angles. And in particular, the interior angles, their sum must be strictly less than pi, which of course differs from the uh, Euclidean plane where they, they would have to equal pi or the sphere where they would have to be strictly greater than pi. So here's a little exercise. You can see this in in certainly in Bearden, but before we, we prove that, there's some pictures of some triangles. So that's the same triangle in the upper half plane, the, the Poincaré disc and the Klein disc. I've not put marked the angles on the Klein disc because uh, they're not, they're not the, uh, the angles you would first expect. And I, I probably, I, I, I should have said, but forgot to say that the angle, if I have, um, two geodesics that, that meet on the boundary, then I say the angle is zero. I think I had that in, I had this sentence here. If the sides intersect on the boundary, you define the angle to be zero. Right, so let's come back to this statement about the area of the triangle here. So let, this, is, this is a little exercise. Again, we're going to use the upper half plane. It's the easiest 
way to do this. So let's think about uh, the, the left-hand picture. I'm going to take a triangle where one of the vertices is off at infinity, its angle is zero. And so I get this yellow triangle on the left here. And what do I need to do? I need to integrate um, dx dy over one over y squared. That's the formula for the area that comes out of the, the metric. And again, that's just using standard um, um, many variable calculus. So I want to integrate this form um, like that. Well, what do I do? First of all, I'm going to I'm going to suppose that x lies between uh, this point here, which is minus cos alpha, and this is cos beta. And then this is supposed to be the unit circle, so I want to take all points uh, in the y direction that are between here, which would be root one minus x squared, all the way off to infinity. And the form I need to, int to integrate is one over y squared dx dy. Well, it's a really easy exercise. First, I do my y integration, and I see that th th that gives me minus one over y. And so that means that I'm, when I substitute in, I should be integrating one over square root of one minus x squared dx. I substitute x is equal to, to cos of u. Um, and, and I finally end up with this formula. So the area of this yellow triangle on the left is pi minus alpha minus beta. And that's good because remember, the third angle was zero. So it agrees with the formula we had. Now take any old triangle with angles alpha, beta, and gamma. Make the side between the, the, the vertices with angle beta, that maybe we'll call this vertex B, this vertex A, and this vertex C. We make the, the side through B and C, we make that into an arc of, say, the imaginary axis or any vertical line. Then I can, can write the, the, uh, the area of the, of the yellow. So, so let's say this is the yellow area. It should be the blue area minus the green area. And can everybody see that? But if I take the area of the green thing off the area of the blue thing, I should get the area of the yellow thing. Well, I know what the, what the, both the green and the blue are of the same form as the thing we've just done. So for the blue one, I'm gonna have pi, I'm going to have this angle here is alpha plus delta. That's a bad color, let's choose this. This angle here is alpha plus delta. So that gives me this formula. And for the, um, for the green one, I just get a delta here. And that angle here you see is pi minus gamma. And so, I, and so if I uh, expand that out, I get lots of minus signs. I have to be very careful with my minus signs. Some pi's cancel. And that should have been a minus sign there. That's a typo. Pi minus alpha minus beta minus gamma. Great. So triangle groups. We're, we're in the home straight now. So let T be a hyperbolic triangle with angles alpha, beta, and gamma. Later on, we're going to be thinking about these as being pi over p, pi over q, and pi over r. But for the moment, I just want to think about any angles alpha, beta, and gamma. And let, I don't, I'm not sure whether what the standard notation here is. So I'm writing delta. This is, sometimes people would write W for, for a coxeter group there. But I'm going to write delta of alpha, beta, gamma. It's a group, it's a reflection group generated by reflection to the sides of the triangle. And gamma is the index two orientation preserving subgroup. So for example, gamma will, would be in uh, SL, PSL2R if I'm in the upper half plane model, whereas delta would be in this extended thing where I'm adding in um, orientation reversing asymmetries. Now, if you try to write down uh, an element, say of PSL2R, um, so that which is a rotation, uh, well, it ends up having, or being, well, even if you try to, yeah, if you write it trying to be a rotation through angle alpha, another one rotation through angle beta, whose product is a, is a 
rotation through angle gamma, it, it becomes a little bit hard work, a little bit nasty. So actually the easiest way to, to write down good matrices for triangle groups, and I'm going to need this next time in my, my talk about uh, arithmetic triangle groups and Takeuchi's theorem, um, is to use a model that's specially developed for, the, um, for triangles. So I'm going to define the gram matrix to be the matrix that you've seen here. Sometimes people write twice that matrix. We sometimes will be doing that later, but it doesn't really matter. Okay. You'll notice three things about this matrix. First of all, it's symmetric. Secondly, uh, its trace is equal to three. And thirdly, you can calculate the determinant. I'm writing C alpha to be cos alpha. That's just simply because if I wrote down everything with causes and so causes, the, the formula becomes too long for my page. Now, a simple argument shows that the, the, I, using kind of tri trigonometry, that I can I can write this determinant, this this formula here, equals this product of four cosines, or four times minus four times the product of four cosines. And when the angle sum is between zero and pi, I could, should probably even have had less than or equal to zero there, we can see that all four cosines are positive. And so, so this means that, um, that, that this determinant is negative. So G has trace of G is positive and the determinant of G is negative. It's symmetric, so it has real eigenvalues um, because, so this would be the product of the eigenvalues, this would be the sum of the eigenvalues. Because their product is negative, I know that one of them must be negative and two positive, or else all three negative. The, the sum of them, some of the eigenvalues should be positive, so I can't possibly have all three of them being negative. And so I, I get something where I which is equivalent to this um, form Q that we saw before. In other words, it has two positive eigenvalues and one negative eigenvalue, or signature two comma one. And that's good because that's exactly the sort of, of matrix that, I, that gives me a quadratic form of the form that I can now go through all my, my rigmarole of defining uh, the isometry group and the distance just using this quadratic form given by the gram matrix. So I'm going to use this G as a quadratic form and then I'm going, I, I can just, and I'm also going to, to choose um, the reflections so that they are the orthogonal complement with respect to this quadratic form of the three coordinate vectors. Remember the formula for a reflection should be that, well, it, if you, it's got determinant one, it should be minus the identity uh, plus um, x n over two x n over n n times n, and I'm going to take n to be uh, to be the, the three um, coordinate vectors, and that immediately gives me easy formulae for these for these generators, reflection generators, or for the, um, the, the uh, orientation preserving elliptic generators in the, um, in, in the index two subgroup case. And that's going to be very useful. This is going to be part of my starting point for the next lecture. So maybe when we come, which is in about a month's time. So maybe when we get to that, you should think of, if you're wanting to, you should just revise this little section because this is where I will start off next time. The, the reason why this is useful is that all three of the generators for the reflection group or the pair of generators for the, for the, uh, for the orientation preserving group, together with the, um, the, the quadratic form, that they have matrix entries that lie in this a simple extension of, of the, um, this, this, not this field, uh, which is an extension of the rationals. And this is going to be, the arithmeticity is going to be all about dealing with reflections.
Okay, so we're going to be interested in discrete triangle groups, and that's when my three angles are of the form pi over p, pi over q, and pi over r. Uh, and p, q, and r are supposed to be natural numbers or possibly infinity. When we have an angle of zero, I write that as p over uh, pi over infinity. And then there's a formula, so there's a, one, uh, uh, um, a, uh, a theorem that says that in this case, um, the group is discrete and it nicely tessellates the, the hyperbolic plane. And you can see this using the Poincaré polyhedron theorem. And again, that's, I think, the subject of my fourth talk. Um, but here's a beautiful picture, which I stole from the internet. So here's a reference to the place where I stole it from. And this is a picture of a tessellation where, where I have uh, angles pi over seven in all of the, the um, Actually, I think I have two pi over seven, don't I? Well, anyway. So that's a beautiful picture of what these, these tessellations end, end up looking like. So that is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor John Parker, for such a nice talk. If anyone has any questions, as Professor Parker do not have much time to attend questions, Yeah, this PQR can be non-integer also, no? PQR, PQR, they can be non-integers also, no? no That's right. So I, I was doing it for general uh, angles, alpha, beta, and gamma, but yeah. I'm wanting to restrict myself to the to the, the, the interesting discrete, the, the Coxeter case is when they're all, um, that those are all integers. And so that's, I'm just specializing to my angle should be pi over P, pi over Q, pi over R, where they're integers, or I have this, if I have zero angle, I just write that integer as infinity. Yeah. You, maybe you remember from last time we did the modular group, that corresponds to a two, three infinity triangle group. Yeah. That's maybe the link to the previous talk. Thank you. So we don't see the two-three triangle groups in the Poincaré disk model generally. Pictures of that triangle, right? So we usually see them in the Poincaré disk because that's the easiest place to draw pictures. You can find them on the on the internet in the Klein disk or the upper half plane. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to draw this this picture with the with the gram matrix. The gram matrix okay. is easier for calculation than for pictures, but it's. You know, you can, if you want a little exercise, see if you can write down matrices in PSL2R for, for the, for the, for the, um, the uh, orientation preserving subgroup of the alpha, beta, gamma triangle group. Okay. It's not straightforward. Let's see. Huh. Sagar, do you have any question? No, no, I don't. Okay, I thought you. Oops. Okay. Professor okay. Parker, if there is no other talker, then let's thank him again. Thank you. Your next talk would be on 19th October, perhaps, I think, at 4 p.m., right? That's right. Thanks. Okay, then see you okay. next month. Thank you, everybody. And yeah. um, I'll see you next time. Right. Yeah. Bye. Bye bye. Bye, sir. Organizers can wait. Yeah, so what about next time? I mean, next lecture is on 21st. Mm, first by Professor Magnet. Ah, Magnet. And second by Professor Sudarshan Gurjar, IIT Bombay. Ah, so that. Uh,
that first lecture you are he yeah, requested him to short on in some sense yeah i have requested him i inform him today also okay and yeah. i will remind him again yeah right so uh, i think at that time uh, who will chair it that is one question that is uh, krishnan would be available then 